Here we go. Okay. So this is now recording. Yes. Um, so what we're going to do for anyone that paid to come to the workshop, we do have your email addresses and we will send you the recording. So you will get all the narrated slides and everything that you hear this evening. We wanted to do that for you so that you can just enjoy the presentation and know that you will have it recorded. We will send you the link to that. Okay, uh, let's see. Anything else for housekeeping? The chat box, Lorna's going to kind of monitor that chat box. So um, go ahead with your questions on there. Uh, we will send you a link to a survey when this is over, and we'll talk a little bit at the end about future webinars. Okay, so let's uh, get moving into this. We want to start by telling you a little bit about ourselves and how all of this started because I think that will um, help you kind of understand the importance of it to us even and the passion we have for it. In terms of myself, I'm Dr. Sandy Duran. I'm the Associate Superintendent of the Florida Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. I supervise about 30 schools from Jacksonville to Tallahassee up in the north all the way down to Miami in the south and I've been doing that since 2002. Prior to that I worked in Boston. I was teaching classes there for a number of colleges and that's actually where I met Lorna Kaufman, Dr. Lorna Kaufman, when I was working on my doctorate at Boston University. It was suggested that I find a place to do an internship, and it was just wonderful that I found Kaufman Educational Associates because Lorna not only changed my professional life in, in great ways and enriching my understanding of reading, but she changed my personal life. I have two sons. My older son is 32 years old. And when he was little, I was really proud of myself because I figured out that he had ADHD. And that was back in the day. It wasn't a household word. Nobody had heard of it. And I just at first thought I was the worst mother in the whole wide world. And then I kind of stumbled onto this information. But what I didn't know was that my son was also dyslexic. So by the time I met Lorna, my son was in the fourth grade. And all I knew was that he was trying so hard. You know, we'd gotten ahead of the ADHD. and. Um, he was on a medication that was working for him, and he, he was trying. He, but for some reason, um, and he could, he could do okay on worksheets, but I could tell that there was just, I, I didn't understand why it was so frustrating for all of us. And at that time, I met Lorna, and she was able to, um, okay, we have a question. Renee wants to be the presenter. Um, well. I can give you the mic, Renee, if that's something important to you. In a minute, I can give you the mic. Um, at any rate, with my son with the dyslexia, Lorna was the first one to do an assessment, and we were able to go into, she was able to come with me into meetings in his school, and he ended up getting help that nobody else got because of our knowledge and because of what we advocated for, and it really changed things for him. The ways in which he was able to to learn how to read changed things for him. And I mean, he's still dyslexic. He's 32 years old, but he has gone through school. He's, he's gotten a two-year degree as an audio engineer, and he loves his job, and he runs all over Orlando as project manager for shows and um, in charge of the audio. So so that's how Lorna and I got together, and that's, that's my personal and um, professional um, connection to the topic. And uh, Lorna and I, Lorna, was it five or six years ago that we bumped into one another again in Boston? It was about that when you came up for a conference. Right, right. I was being trained in crucial conversations in Boston. <laughs> and we got together and I found out at that time that Lorna had a dream to publish this book that she'd been working on. And so we kind of got together and this book came out last year and the website and now some of these trainings. So that's how we kind of reconnected. But Lorna, tell us about yourself. Sure. And thanks, Sandy. And welcome, everybody. Uh, yes, my name is Lorna Kaufman. I'm a developmental psychologist. And I've been specializing in the evaluation of children with reading problems for more years than I really want to admit to. I, I began my work in this field in some of the top clinics in Boston. I worked at Children's Hospital at the Eunice Kennedy Shriver Evaluation Clinic and then at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center LD Clinic. I later opened a private practice 
so I could devote more time to helping parents navigate the public school system. A lot of parents needed help to, to get their kids help in reading. I've served as president of the New England branch of the International Dyslexia Association, and I've been a member of the National Board of the International Dyslexia Association for many years. I'm past president of the Massachusetts Council for Learning Disabilities and served on the Governor's Advisory Council for Special Education in Massachusetts for several years. And I hope that you all find our webinar informative and helpful tonight. If you have any questions as we go along, please type them into the chat box and we will make every attempt to try to address as many as we possibly can while we're together this evening. Okay, well, without further ado, you see that um, I, we, we kind of wanted to give you our background, our passion, so you see where we're coming from. Uh, so let's, let's get into the presentation now. Here we go. Lorna, take it away. I will take it away, absolutely. Well, you know, reading continues to be a very significant problem in our schools today. Well over one-third of our children struggle with reading and are reading below grade level. And that's actually a conservative estimate at this point. Over 82% of the children who are receiving special education in public school are kids with reading problems. And you know that's kind of interesting because we worry so much about the expense of special education, and it's true. Towns are spending a huge amount of money on special education services. But when you think that 82% of our uh, kids in special education are children with reading problems, and we know how to prevent reading problems, this says that we're spending billions of dollars on a, on a problem we know how to prevent. Children with reading problems come from all socioeconomic backgrounds. And reading problems occur in every public school in the country. Now, I say public school because there are some private schools that will actually screen out any children who have trouble with reading. Um, reading problems particularly occur in areas where there's a lot of poverty and where families are unable to provide a literacy-rich and language-rich environment that we know to be so important in the development of reading skills. This is particularly uh, pre prevalent in low-performing schools, especially low-performing public schools, where they're unable to really devote the resources they need to devote for evidence-based reading instruction. There's a very strong link between reading problems and societal problems. Dr. Timothy Shanahan, who is the director of the University of Chicago Center for Literacy, is quoted as saying, every social pathology appears to be related to literacy attainment. Let me give you an idea about what he's talking about. 88% of high school dropouts struggle with reading. That's huge. 70% of prison inmates read below a fourth grade level. I was really shocked to hear that. 85% of all juveniles in our court system are functionally illiterate. Three out of four people on welfare can't read. That means they're not even able to read the directions on their prescriptions. Wow. wow. Why don't we go on to the next slide there, Sandy? Yes, yes. Let's talk a little bit about the research. Yeah, yeah, you know, Lorna, that's just that that's just really sobering statistics. And, you know, I'm happy that we have people here who who really want to to do something about it, and make a difference. Yeah, tell us about the research, Lorna. That's a basic skill, but when people have trouble with that basic skill, it affects their lives. It affects the lives of adults in very, very profound ways. I want to talk for a little bit about the NICHD research. NICHD stands for the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. The NICHD is one of the branches of the National Institutes of Health, NIH, one of our, our, our wonderful publicly um, funded research branches. They've been studying reading problems since the early 80s. And they've studied hundreds of thousands of kids across the country and we've learned a lot. 
We've learned who has trouble learning to read. We've learned why they have trouble learning to read. And we've learned what we can do to change the situation. We've learned that most reading problems can be prevented with a structured phonics-based reading program in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and third grade. That's particularly important to uh, implement that kind of an evidence-based program in areas of poverty for children who are most at risk for reading problems. Let me, let me stop here for a second and clarify what I mean by evidence-based instruction because you'll hear Sandy and I referring to that a lot. Evidence-based instruction refers to instruction that we have learned through the research, instruction that works. An evidence-based reading curriculum and K through 3 and the teacher expertise are really the two keys to preventing reading problems. Okay, go ahead, Sandy. Okay. Um, one thing we emphasize in the book, and we really want to emphasize, is don't wait. If you think that there is a child, if you're a parent and you're concerned about your child, don't wait. If you're a teacher and you have a child that you're concerned about, if you're a principal and you have somebody you're concerned about, don't wait. We want you to, to really um, grasp the importance of moving forward and getting a professional evaluation for this child so they can help the, get the help this child needs. And there's a lot of reasons that schools don't act, which again, we go into this in more detail in the book, but I think a lot of you will probably be able to resonate um, with some of these reasons. You know, there's the financial issue. I know in the public system, it can be very costly for a public school um, and there are actually children who receive a diagnosis of a learning disability in one school district. And when they move the qualifications in order to, to have a, quote, learning disability change because in that school district they can't afford it and suddenly their reading disability goes away. So there's a big financial piece. In the private system, I know that many times we're concerned about budget. We're concerned about our own salaries, you know, depending on getting enough students. And sometimes there may be a fear, oh, well, if I press this and we find out that this child has a reading disability, and what if people think that we can't meet the needs, we may lose the child. So it's better to say nothing and allow the child to come here and kind of limp along because we don't dare impact our budget or say something that will result in the child being removed from the school. So that's another reason that that sometimes schools don't act. Sometimes people think, well, this is developmental, it's going to go away. Or sometimes we superintendents are putting pressure on you teachers out there to get through your curriculum. And you're thinking, I can't stop because if I start trying to figure out what's going on with this child, I'm going to lose my momentum and, and that's not going to be good. I have to follow the curriculum. And sometimes we just want to get through the school year and we don't realize the cumulative effect of not acting. Uh, why don't parents act when a child is clearly struggling? Again, there is that hope that, well, if I just wait long enough, this, this is going to improve. They just have to catch up and then they'll be fine. Um, maybe sometimes parents are afraid to label. And I know as a parent myself, I found out that I would rather my child have a diagnostic label that can lead to help than to get a label like lazy and not trying hard enough. But, but sometimes there's that fear around labeling or sometimes, you know, as parents, there's there's a lack of understanding that there is an underlying problem and that there's just this, this thought that they just need to try harder. So these are all reasons that, that people don't act. But we really want to encourage you that if you know of a student, after we go through our presentation, if you begin to say, wow, this is somebody that I think may have a reading problem, then act on it get this person to someone that can do a full diagnosis because the longer you wait, the harder it's going to get. Reading is fundamental to everything that happens in school. These kids are going to develop self-esteem problems and there are evidence-based methods to help children with reading problems. So the sooner you act, the better. And it's going to take a while. I can tell you that when you start trying to get the help, it takes a while. So it's, so it's good to act. 
Um, yes, and we have an interesting comment here. Parents are told by doctors sometimes they have to wait until after the second grade. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, all of these things. Jen, I agree with you, definitely. And there there was that whole wait to fail model. That whole second grade thing was that they had to be two grade levels behind. So we had to wait to prove they were failing. Um, yeah, and the whole thing I, about I, getting an accurate model, diagnosis. is model important. has pretty much been put aside. I'm not seeing an awful lot of schools still use that model of wait to fail. On the other hand, it's difficult for schools to act with a very young child in kindergarten or first grade. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, and that whole, wow, we have great comments here. Yes, that comorbidity between dyslexia, ADHD, and trying to figure out which is which and tease it all out. It, it's a complex thing. Um, okay, well, we're going to look a little bit at why children have trouble learning to read. So, Lorna, go ahead. Sure. Um, the National Research Council has identified three categories that contribute to reading problems. Uh, there are the child risk factors, the environmental risk factors, and the educational risk factors. So let's take those one at a time, and, and I can give you some kind of a sense of what the risk factors are. Child risk factors really include health and medical conditions that are linked to reading. For example, if a child has a family history of close family members, who have a reading problem, that child is more likely to have a reading problem. Not all kids with that history will develop reading problems, but it's something that you need to be aware of. And by close family members, I'm talking here about uh, parents, aunts, uncles, and siblings. Children who have a history of delayed oral language development are at significant risk for developing a reading problem. And we're going to go into that a little bit more in depth because that's a very strong risk factor. Children with hearing impairment, uh, and that includes kids who have a history of chronic ear infections, chronic otitis media. Those ear infections are often associated with intermittent hearing losses. And the intermittent hearing losses, if they occur at critical, critical points in language development, um, become associated with a delay in language development, which is then associated with problems in reading. And then there is attention deficit disorder, which has already been brought up by one of you. Attention deficit disorder refers to trouble that kids have with focusing and with attention. And it can interfere with learning. However, not to reading specifically. If a child is having difficulty focusing on everything, math and social studies and all subjects, then it might be worth checking out whether or not we're talking about ADD. But if it's to reading only specifically and doing well in everything else, then I don't think we're necessarily talking about ADD. There are many reasons for kids to be inattentive in the classroom. One of them is anxiety. That can cause inattention in the classroom. Another is an auditory processing disorder. Again, that causes inattention in the classroom. A communication disorder, particularly in the area of receptive language, can cause inattention. ADD is just one reason for children to be inattentive in the classroom, and it's really important to rule out the other issues before accepting an ADD diagnosis. Let's talk for a second about the environmental risk factors. Reading is a language-based activity. And the language environment in the home is vitally important for early language development. So children who come from homes that don't promote and support language interaction and literacy are at risk. Verbal interaction with the adults is really critical. There are some families in which children are spending more hours in front of a screen, be it TV or computer, whatever, but they're spending more time watching something on a screen than they are interacting verbally with the adults in their lives. And then the educational risk factors. While child and environmental risk factors are real, and they're definitely uh, considerable, a child's engagement with the educational system 
accounts for most of our reading problems. And the reason for that is because most reading problems can be prevented when teachers in kindergarten, first, second, and third grade are trained and have expertise with evidence-based reading instruction. And when schools make decisions to use evidence-based curriculum. Andy, can you move on to the next one? Yes, we're going to talk a little bit about red flags for reading problems, and we're going to go more in depth on each of these. You have language-based red flags, behavioral red flags, developmental red flags, educational red flags. We're going to talk about all this because you all signed up for this workshop because you wanted to know, how do I know when a child has a reading problem? So now we're going to go in depth. Now, some people think, oh, that's seeing words backwards or seeing letters backwards or somebody that needs a color overlay. Um, Diagnosing a reading problem is far more detailed and complex than that. And our next session, we're going to get really, really deep onto different kinds of assessments and how you put those together. Tonight, we're going to take a look at these four main things so that you as a teacher or a parent can begin connecting the dots and say, wow, I, I, I see those kinds of things in this child. So that's what we're really going to get into. And we're going to start with language markers, and we're going to talk about all these different language markers. Again, there are four language markers, phonology, morphology, syntax, and semantics. And we're going to take each of these one at a time. And as we do, think about a child that you know, because my guess is you tuned in tonight because there's somebody you're worried about. So think about that person. Now, before we get into phonology, we're going to talk a little bit about phonological awareness. Lorna, tell them a little bit about that. Yeah. What I'd like to do is talk about the difference between phonological awareness and phonics. So in order to do that, we need to begin by discussing what a phoneme is. A phoneme is the shortest uttered sound in our language. For example, it could be the sound of a single letter, like k or p. Or it could be the sound of two or more letters combined, like oo or ow. But it is the shortest uttered sound in our language. Now, phonological awareness refers to the ability to attend to and manipulate those phonemes. So let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about. If I say the word cat, I'm co-articulating all those sounds in cat. I'm smooshing, I'm smooshing the sounds together. But I do know that cat is made up of three separate sounds. K, A, T. I could also tell you that cat rhymes with mat, sat, bat. I could also tell you that cat has the same beginning sounds as kiss, car, candy. I could also tell you that it has the same ending sounds as hit, pet, chat. In other words, I know and I can talk about those individual sounds. It sounds so obvious to us because we're adults and we're, we're all probably very good readers. That is not obvious to a beginning reader. And it's a breakthrough that is critical in order for them to have the skills to begin reading. Now, phonics is different. Phonics is the association of sound with letters. So a child has to have well-developed phonological awareness in order to be able to associate those sounds with letters. In other words, the child has to have been able to identify and separate the individual sounds in a word so that he can associate each individual sound with letters. So kids are able to sound out because they know the sounds that are associated with letters. So if I try to sound out the word boat, I know the individual sounds of the first and last letter, b and t. But I also know that oa is a combination that makes another sound, and it sounds like o. So that's phonics is the association of those sounds with letters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what happens, how does all this come into play in learning language, and how does this then become demonstrated in kids 
all the way on up as they get older, or even in adults, you can hear people that have have problems with phonology. Well, let's take a look back at how we learn our language. So I like to pick picture um, a nice New England family, since that's where I hail from, a nice New England family. <laughs> and the mom's on the phone, and the mom's saying, I'm going to the doctor, and she's holding the baby, and the baby starts saying, ta-da-da-da, ta da 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 And the mom gets all excited and she says, she's talking, she's talking. Now, at this point, this little New England baby doesn't know that you can go to the park, to the mall, and to the zoo. They're just repeating a chunk. Tadadakta, and they're hearing that as a chunk. Well, very gradually, as this little child learns to talk, they figure out that you can go tadaka, you can you can go tada mall. So they're beginning to separate out those chunks. Well, by the time they get to kindergarten, they're beginning to to be able to put together all these words into a sentence. That is why that when we have kids in kindergarten in early phonological awareness, we're having them clap out the individual words. So we may have the class stand up and they say, I am going to the park because we're wanting them to hear the separate words because these children with phonological problems are not able to do that. Well, the challenge comes now. Now we've got them hearing the separate words, but now they have to hear each individual phoneme in a word. And this becomes really difficult because that's how they're going to learn how to spell and read. And if they cannot sequence the phonemes in order, it's going to become a challenge. I have so many examples of this, um, and, and I'll, I'll give you um, my best attempt here, this is something you're not going to hear anywhere else, folks, so <laughs> this is very unique, but the best way that I can get you to understand this is by having you do a tongue tangler, because to me, that's kind of a simulation of what it's like to have difficulty sequencing phonemes. So I'm going to give you something here. I'm going to ask you to try to learn to say this without even having to look at the screen, because I think if you read it, it might make it easier. So I'm going to have you take a few minutes to learn it, and then I'm going to open up the mics and ask somebody to try to say this. A box of biscuits, a box of mixed biscuits, and a biscuit mixer. So in order to remember it, remember the first two lines say a box of, the second line you're adding in your adjective, and your third line you are introducing a, a new thing. It's not a biscuit anymore. It's a biscuit mixer. A box of biscuits, a box of mixed biscuits, and a biscuit mixer. So I'm going to turn on the mics, and if somebody would like to say it. Brave person. Who wants to try? Yeah, need a brave person here, Sandy. <laughs> I'll call on somebody. <laughs> Somebody give it a try. A box of biscuits, a box of mixed biscuits, and a biscuit mixer. Janet Chase, since I know you or knew you years ago, would you like to try it? Okay, I'll call on somebody else that maybe I... Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, give it a try. Oh. Okay, hang on. I just need to get my microphone out. Okay. I'm sorry. I said I was muted. <laughs> That's Can you okay. hear me now? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Try it. Okay. A box of biscuits, a box of mixed biscuits, and a biscuit mixer. Okay. Now try oh, to say it. Try, you did great. Try to say it faster and try not to look at it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I can't do that. A box of biscuits, a box of mixed biscuits, and a biscuit mixer. Nice. Okay. Anybody else want to try it? Janet, you want to try it? Since I picked on you before. Okay. A, box of biscuits, a box of mixed biscuits and a biscuit mixer. You guys are like way too good. You're not proving my point for me. <laughs> okay. Well, here's what normally happens in this tongue tangler is that people mix up the order of the phonemes. If you look at this, the letter X has two oh. phonemes in it. I'm keeping it. I'm keeping the mics on in case anybody else wants to try it. <laughs> Just let us know. Oh, I gave you too much practice time. We have, um, yeah, and I think everybody was really trying to get it right. Um, but what happens is, so in the letter X, 
you have two phonemes, right? Because sometimes a letter can have two phonemes in it. So you have cuts. So the brain is a pattern seeker. So the brain says, okay, I got it figured out. It's cuss. Then we switch it up to sk. So the brain's getting a little confused now. And once we, we tell our brain we switched it up to sk, then we switch it up to cuss. <laughs> and so we keep switching the order of these two phonemes. And what eventually happens when people try to say this, um, and they're not, they're not as um, articulate as all of our volunteers, um, they sound almost like they're drunk because they say the phonemes backwards. I've heard people say, now let's see if I can do it backwards. I've heard people say it like this, a busk of bixits, a busk of misked bixits, and a bixit misker. <laughs> so <I'll... laughs> anybody have a comment on that? <laughs> when I tried to say it, I the last line came out and a bisker mixic. Okay, thank you, thank you. I even messed up the ER sounds. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so you see what's happening? Well, that is what is happening to someone that has a phonology problem. And the reason I wanted to illustrate it like this is because if you don't see this, then you get into all that, oh, they're seeing a word backwards or they're... No, that's not the point. The point is when the phonemes go in, it's difficult for them to get them back out in the right order. So do you understand how germane this is to the whole process? If you can't sequence phonemes in order, how are you going to spell a word if in your head you're really not even able to clearly say the word back? And how are you going to be able to read it? So what was happening with my son, who was just really trying, was I'd be trying to do his homework with him, and he would be at the table saying, I'm flustated. Well, that right there should have been a red flag to me. <laughs> I'm flustated. And yeah, maybe a really young child might say that, but past the time when other children were speaking like that, um, when he was probably in sixth grade, we had this crazy, ridiculous argument that the song was not the Star Spangled Banner. According to him, it was the Star Springled Banner. And why I was playing the role of the crazy parent saying, you have to believe me, there are other people who believe like I do. It really is the Star Spangled Banner. Um, oh, interesting. Okay, we had somebody that um, tried it out with a child. Yeah. And see, what happened with in our family, you know, both of our children were adopted from birth, which is just a beautiful thing to pick up your, your little babies at the airport at like five days old and get this wonderful little packages. Now, my younger son, um, when he was very young, very, very young, he could actually say the word sea anemone. <laughs> so you think of the phonemes in sea anemone. That's a real tricky one that even some adults may have a hard time with. So, so you begin to see the signals of, of what's happening and you want to validate and help these students. Otherwise, they're just going to be looked at, you know, as being lazy or whatever. So that's, that's something to key into. That whole phonology and sequencing phoneme things is big. Then you have morphology, which has to do with meaning units within words, prefixes, suffixes. And you may have some older students who are not making the connection between the meaning unit and the prefix and suffix. You know, you have a child in the sixth grade who's still writing jumped, walked, you know, because an ED, when you put it on a word, can make three different sounds. It can be ed, d, or t. And in this case, with jumped, we hear it as t. So if you see a child putting that in, you know that could be a red flag. Now here's a here's a writing sample from a fifth grade student. I coded these things and I asked these students, what would you do on your on uh, if you had a day to do anything you wanted? And I was ready to cry when I got this sample back because the content of this paper was far beyond some of the other kids. Most of our fifth graders said if they had a day to do anything they wanted, they'd go to the mall or they'd play video games all day. Not this kid. They would Now, I was trying to write what I thought he was saying. I had I would get the president to write. What he actually was saying here is I would get the president's autograph. I would end world hunger, and I'd like to be on a hockey team and win the, I didn't know much, so I put Italy Cup. It was supposed to be the Stanley Cup. But look at the indications of a phoneme problem here. Presidents. 
frequently you're going to see an entire syllable or sounds left out because it has to do with sequencing the phoneme. So a word like president, this fifth grader, the best he can do is presidents. Um, look down here at hunger. You hear that n sound in the middle of the word. That's He's having a hard time peeling off that phoneme. Uh, look down, it was supposed to be Stanley that I thought was Italy cup. Stanley cup, again, that n in the middle. Peeling off that phoneme is a challenge for this child. Syntax is Andy, another thing. The rules Andy, are... that's a good Go writing ahead. sample. But I want to point out that spelling errors are very diagnostic, uh, and we'll be talking about that a bit more in our next session. But uh, the reason for evaluating spelling is because it goes hand in hand with reading and it can be really very diagnostic. Yes, yes. Um, syntax, you know, listen to the way the children are speaking. Look at their oral expression. You know, an older child, I could have went, we brung it here. Um, now, some of this can be environmental. Um, maybe that is the way their families speak. But a child that appears to be average or above average, perhaps in calculating things in math, and you wouldn't expect to hear these kinds of things in their language, it could be another red flag. And these kids often take things literally. It's hilarious. If we had more time, I'd give you some illustrations of ways that our son has kept us laughing through the years when he takes things literally. But that's another area of language that you might see something. Now let's take a look at the behavioral and physical red flags, Lona. Yeah, there are a number of behavioral red flags that signal when a child is in distress. And I think it's our job as parents and teachers to interpret them. Some kids start to act out. For example, when they get frustrated and they're struggling with reading, some of them will become the class clown or they'll start to get into trouble in class. They're distracting the others. Some kids do the opposite. They start to withdraw. They're not interacting much with people. Many of them become depressed. Those children are trying to hide their problem. Some children become anxious and fidgety, and they have trouble focusing. As I mentioned before, it might look like ADD. And other kids develop physical problems. Some will develop headaches and stomach aches. Pay attention to that child who's in the nurse's office a lot and, or who doesn't want to go to school in the morning. They're trying to tell us something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Children have trouble reading. It affects their self-esteem. I mean, after all, they've not been successful at the activity that is valued so highly by their parents and emphasized by their teacher. Reading is the major part of the curriculum in K through 3 and they are beginning to feel like a failure. Many will start to think of themselves as stupid. And as children get older, these issues of self-esteem become part of the problem, particularly if they continue to be unsuccessful in learning how to read. Okay, let's take a look at the developmental red flags. There are a number of salient red flags that have to do with a child's oral language development. And that's really one of the most important markers. When a child is slow in meeting the milestones for oral language, he's at risk for developing reading problems. The more severe and persistent the delay, the more likely the child is to develop reading problems. Let me repeat that because it's important. The more severe and persistent the delay, the more likely the child is to develop reading problems. I would say over the years that I've evaluated children, the majority of the kids that I have seen have been children who had delayed language problems. The um, issue of delayed language can be very confusing, especially for parents. Because when you think about it, most kids really do learn to speak. It's just that they're very slow in developing their, their speech and in developing their language. So parents assume that once they start to talk, that everything's fine and the problem has gone away. But it isn't quite that simple. Because while they are able to express themselves in their speaking, there are other parts of their language structure that have still not caught up. 
we had a very interesting example of this in our family. We had a um, when our grandson was born, you know, we all thought he was this wonderful, brilliant child who was just going de destined for great things. But he was slow in learning to speak. His motor development was fine. He learned to walk early. Um, he was great at climbing stairs, throwing a ball. All the motor, motor developmental milestones were right on track. Now, my daughter and son-in-law had read a lot of parent books, and they knew that his language was slow. In fact, very slow. So when I suggested that we get a speech and language evaluation, my son-in-law and his parents became really upset. What was I implying about this child that we all knew was so perfect? They did not want him labeled. It's a very personal issue for an awful lot of people. So I laid low for a little while, but not too long. After a few months, I made an appointment for language evaluation myself. And the speech and language therapist who did the evaluation was really clear about the extent of his language de delay and recommended language therapy. He was in language therapy for over two years. And there's no question in my mind that we really averted a serious reading problem. He was doubly lucky because when he entered kindergarten, he had a teacher who, interestingly enough, was herself dyslexic. And so she used a reading program that was designed for dyslexic children. She was using one of the Orton Gillingham reading programs, which was the best thing that could have happened to him. So after kindergarten, he was really off to the races. But it's really important to pick up on the issue of language because it is a real important marker. Some children will start to have trouble organizing what they want to say. They're very cluttered in, what, in their expressive output. And sometimes it's hard to follow them. If you're a member of the family, you know what they're talking about. But strangers would have a difficult time knowing what they're saying. There are other children who have difficulty with word retrieval. And they use a lot of word fillers like stuff and thing. They have particular difficulty with the recall of proper nouns, especially remembering people's names. And then some children have trouble with auditory processing disorder. I want to talk for just a minute about what that means. They're having trouble perceiving and understanding oral language, despite the fact that they have good hearing acuity. One of the examples that I often give to parents comes from a song that I'm sure you were all much too young to remember, but I'm going to tell you the song. It goes, Marizy Dotes and Dozy Dotes and Little Lambsy Divey. Now, it's hard to understand what those words are because I'm slurring them all together, which is the way they're done in the song. But if I slow it down and I put emphasis on some of the syllables, you can hear what I'm saying. Mares eat oats and does eat oats and little lambs eat ivy. That gives you an idea of the difficulty that some children are having in perceiving language. They can hear it just fine. Their trouble is in the perception. Go ahead, Sandy. Okay. Let's look at some of the um, educational red flags, Lorna. Okay. I'm looking at um, some of the comments to, and wondering if there are any questions here that I need to address. I don't see any. Okay. Um, yes. Educational red flags. Now, once kids start school and they begin instruction in pre-reading and reading, it becomes more clear who's having in, um, in reading. So let's take it grade by grade. In kindergarten, those children who have trouble with the phonological awareness curriculum and who have trouble learning letters and sounds, those are the kids that we need to step in and start to give them more help right away. Don't wait for them to fail. If you have a good evidence-based curriculum in kindergarten that includes a curriculum in phonological awareness, you don't really need to screen kids. It's those children who are having trouble with that curriculum. If you don't have such a curriculum, then the best screen in kindergarten is actually a pretty short screening. You want to screen for phonological awareness. You want to screen for rapid automatized naming, a RAN. 
and you want to screen for their ability to identify letters and the sounds of letters. Those three things will do it. In grades one through three, look for the kids who over rely on pictures. They're trying to guess at words based on pictures or the kids who over rely on the content of the story to guess. One of the tip offs is, is that when children are doing this, they tend to self correct a lot and they tend to repeat phrases and words a lot because as they go further along in the sentence or further along in the paragraph, they recognize that some of the words that they said before don't make sense. So they go back and try to correct it based on what they read subsequently. Older yes. children, and by older children I'm talking here about kids from 4th through 12th grade, you'll find that they often try to avoid reading. They too are over relying on content and they often guess at words based on the first letter and the word configuration of the word. I see that all the time. For example, if the word in the passage is intending and the child reads it as interesting, indeed they're picking up the beginning of the word and they're picking up the ending of the word, they're missing the middle. That happens very, very frequently. Let me give you another example. If the word is repent and they read repeat, Again, very similar word configuration. They're actually only missing one of the letters, but it completely changes the word. It's really amazing. Mm -hmm. I've, I've collected a number of these examples over the years. Kids can be, can be extremely creative in the word substitutions that they come up with. And I find that bright children really tend to use this strategy of guessing, and they're pretty successful at it until the content becomes too difficult for them to predict. There are a couple of other tip-offs that kids are having a, a difficulty with reading. If children are missing the same words repeatedly, if they tend to skip lines, and if these are the kids that are having trouble with rote memory. Children who are struggling with reading tend to get very tired when they're reading because reading is exhausting for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about these reading lists? This is another way. Now we're moving on from some of these markers that we were talking about, the educational markers, the language-based markers. And now we're going to give you some resources that you can look at um, that will help you know what to expect in a particular grade level. What would make sense to see if a child did not have the problem? Okay, so let me talk for a few minutes about the, the NRC grade list. NRC stands for the National Research Council, and it's a council that was composed of a group of, of distinguished experts in the field of reading. And they put together a list of skills that children, children should know and be able to do at the end of kindergarten, at the end of grade one, grade two, and grade three. Those grades, while they're still just learning how to read. And if you go on to our website, you'll find a summary of those lists on our website. But they're also in the book, if you have the book. These lists are really important, and I, and I recommend you take a look at them because they can guide you if you're uncertain which children are not able to manage grade level literacy skills, I think Sandy is putting up, bringing up the link for you now. <coughs> you can print these uh, lists out from from our our website. Uh, let's see, where did we put them under? About this book, I think about resources. Oh, down. They, they're in one of the boxes. Yeah, free downloads. Free downloads. Okay, so. This is something, oh, here's the summary, and this is something you've done, Lorna, by um, summarizing this so that people can see for each of the grade levels what they should be able to do. So, so this is a resource. It's great. So we have this here for grades K1, 2, and 3. Uh, so just know you can go to the website anytime and get that. All right. And I think we have some more resources for you here. Um, Let's talk. For a couple of minutes about the informal screening test, Sandy. 
these are a series of informal tests that that I wrote to be able to be used um, to see if children are reading at their grade level. Now these tests are informal, and I and I do not recommend that you use them for making educational decisions. I put them together to help parents and teachers to decide whether or not they uh, thought a child had enough of a difficulty with reading to warrant going ahead with a full diagnostic evaluation. These tests are consistent with the NRC guidelines, the guidelines we just showed you that were put together by the reading panel. They're also consistent with the Common Core State Standards. And they also incorporate the grade level sight words from the Dolce sight word list. And the tests are, are meant, as I said, to help parents decide whether their concerns are justified and they should really go ahead and, and seek an independent evaluation. Sandy is bringing up the parent um, version of the grade one word list. Kindergarten test uh, includes tests of phonological awareness, letter sound identification, and some basic skills like writing your name. The tests for grades one through three each include a word list and then two passages with some brief comprehension questions. When you give those tests, you might find that there's a big discrepancy between a child's ability when reading words in the word list versus their ability when reading words in context. Sometimes they're much stronger in context than they are in the word list, because after all, word lists remove the context for them, so they can't guess based on context. Actually, all the research shows us that word list reading is the strongest predictor of reading comprehension. Um, and then some kids will actually do better on the word list than they'll do on the, um, on the paragraphs because they're having difficulty with the linguistic complexity of some of those passages. Um, we've also given you guidelines for how to test children in grades 4 through 12. Um, the best way that we're suggesting you go about that is to use a curriculum-based material from the child's social studies books, either their textbook or maybe a handout that the teacher has given them. And we give you very clear directions on how to go about doing that. Because after all, at that stage, after the third grade, in our schools, we don't teach decoding anymore. By then, we expect kids to be proficient decoders and to be able to use their reading skills to learn new information. So what you really need to know in fourth grade on up is whether a child can manage the reading demands that are expected of him at his grade level in the classroom. Lorna, we have a question. How does this word list compare to the qualitative reading inventory? Are you able to answer that? Yeah, the qualitative reading inventory is actually a very fine test. I like it very much. And there's more research to that. And a qualitative reading inventory is something that I would use as part of an evaluation. The word list here are, are definitely research-based. I, I, I put a lot of um, research into coming up with these words, but they do not have the background that the uh, qualitative reading and inventory has. Okay, and then we have another question. In Connecticut, new dyslexia legislation requires districts to screen for dyslexia. So there are districts looking for something, and they're wondering if these tests might be used for that purpose. I imagine you'd have to look a little more into what Connecticut's requiring. I think I'm familiar with what she's talking about. Decoding dyslexia uh, has been uh, lobbying all of the state legislatures to uh, develop a screening test for dyslexia. And the screening test includes the three things that I mentioned before when I was talking about screening in kindergarten. The screening test that they're recommending is a test of phonological awareness, a test of rapid automatized naming, and a test of uh, letter sound identification. And it's really meant for younger children. It's really meant for kids in kindergarten. So the screening is supposed to take place early to help prevent a lot of reading problems. Okay. I know okay. that's a big issue here in Massachusetts. They did not pass it here. 
Okay. Yeah, and we'll be we'll be talking about the rapid automatic naming in our next session. Um, so we'll get a little more into that. Okay. Um, we okay. Have the other thing that I would suggest to you is um, if you do decide that, that you want to use these tests in any way, look at the videos on our website. They're free. And we have a separate video for every grade level. We even have a separate video for an older child showing you how to work that. The directions are repeated on the video, so you have the written directions in your test packet, as well as the directions on the video. And you'll see how we, Sandy did most of the testing on here, and you'll see how we did the testing. You'll also see me analyzing the child's performance, so you get an idea of the kinds of issues that I'm looking at. I think you'll find it very helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, we do have another question. The list seems this list seems to have more age appropriate words. Do you find that the pre primer, uh, let's just see, and the primer word lists on the QRI are quite advanced? Yeah, I think Lorna, you deliberately made yours a little easier because if this is a screening, if they have trouble with this, then we we know that we really need to go further with this. Correct? That's correct. The, um, the word list and the passages that we put together here are intentionally on the low side because there's such a variation in curriculum across the, the, this country and in Canada. We have a number of people on our webinar tonight from Canada. Um, so I intentionally made them on the low side. So my thought is, is that if you are finding that you're testing a child who is having trouble, I would definitely pay attention. Uh, because I think you're picking something up. One of the other things that uh, I can mention also is that um, we are going to be setting up an opportunity on our website for people to send us videos of their testing of the child if they would like any feedback for that. And if that's something that you're interested in, uh, please let us know um, and we can set it up on the website for you. Okay, um, and I think we're going to ne need to move on in a minute here. We do have a question about assessments to monitor progress for students on IEPs in fluency, writing, and comprehension, regular progress monitoring. I don't know if we'll get into that perhaps next time, or we could maybe try to fold that in next time, Lorna. Let me just address it really quickly right here. In order to monitor progress, you've got to have baseline testing. And yes, I can recommend some very specific tests, but you can only monitor progress if you administer the same test. So you've got to have baseline testing, and then you need to compare standard scores and percentile ranks from one year to the next to see whether there has been growth. Um, next session, we'll be going into much more detail about what you look for in the evaluation of fluency, writing, uh, comprehension and decoding. Okay. All right. Let's 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 move along here. Another place that you can find um, a resource is by looking at what students are expected to do according to Common Core. Now, I know there's all kinds of points of view on Common Core, and we certainly don't want to start a political discussion tonight of all nights. <laughs> But um, it's another resource, and a lot of times people read about the Common Core, but they don't go to the actual legit Common Core website. So I just wanted to take you over there so that you know that this is one other resource. If you go to corestandards.org here, and you click down here on Read the Standards, and you go over to English Language Arts Literacy Standards, and then you look at the Reading Foundational Skills, it doesn't hurt if you have somebody you're concerned about to take a look and say, okay, here's what a first grader is expected to do in phonological awareness in the first grade. Here's what they're expected to do with phonics and word recognition. Oh, they should be able to decode regularly spelled one-syllable words. Oh, okay, so I'm a parent of a first grader, and my first grader is having a hard time decoding two-syllable words following basic patterns. They can't break them into syllables. Okay, that's giving you a clue. So again, another resource for you there, just so you know, that's, that's another place that you can, um, can go 
and and get a, a nice um, selection of, of information. Now, another thing you can do when you're trying to find out, you know, what is the extent of this problem? Should I be concerned? Is take their textbook and take a look at their accuracy in their textbook. Now, I know that many of you are familiar with running records. You know how to take a running record. Um, I see here we have a question about ITBS. So as soon as I um, finish, wrap this up, I will address that. Um, so in, in terms of taking a running record, we often do that in order to get their accuracy level or determine, um, you know, what, what leveled reader to put them in. But what we're suggesting here is that you get their social studies or their science book and find out how accurately they can read it. Because if you have a fifth grade student and you give them a page from their social studies book, this can be very revealing. Count the words, give them at least a full page, count the words, and then see how many words they get correct. So for example, if there were 100 words on the page and they got 80 words correct, 80 divided by 100, there's their point 80. So that means they had 80% accuracy. Well, the meaning of that is that 90 to 95 percentile of accuracy is a student's instructional level. That's where during their reading instruction, we want them to be. We want them to be glitching five to 10% of the time so we can actually help them. Above 95% is their independent level. They can go ahead and read and understand. And below 90% is their frustration level. So we're suggesting that if you have a struggling reader, see if they can actually read what you're expecting them to read. And if they can't, if they're below 90%, talk about, I'm flustated. <laughs> Imagine the kid that's 80%, 70%, 60%, and we're sending that material home and asking them to read it. That right there should tell us something. Um, the ITBS testing, let me address this a little bit. Let me just pull this over so I can see it. Um, it can be used as a baseline, but it's a little tricky because, first of all, you'll learn next week as to what you should be looking at um, in terms of age equivalent, grade equivalent, standard scores, um, percentile ranks, and which of those scores are the ones you need to be looking at when you're, because you can really confuse the picture if you're looking at the wrong scores trying to see progress with the ITBS. Um, and the ITBS really doesn't do enough around all the areas of reading that you're going to want to look at. So you need something in addition to that. It can be a starting point, but we'll give you some more tests next week. All right. In addition to the um, accuracy-based levels, what about fluency, Lorna? Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. I, I will say um, I have found I've had a lot of success. Uh, at team meetings in, in public schools, when I have brought this data into a team meeting, it's very often the case that when a child is in the upper grades, the teachers aren't really aware of their struggle with reading because most of the time they're not reading orally in class. Uh, if it's a bright child, they're sort of getting by. Teacher has no clue. So if I tape a child reading his social studies textbook, and play that back for the team at the team meeting, sometimes people are really, really shocked. Um, now what we can do here is use the same uh, reading that we use to measure accuracy level, but we can also use that to measure their fluency. And fluency is their, their automaticity, and we're measuring their words correct per minute. You're going to need a stopwatch for this. And this is the formula for it. Uh, words correct. T stands for the total seconds. And uh, apply this formula. We have given you the, um, the pages. Uh, and I don't know if we have them here tonight, Sandy, or if they're on the we website. Do. We do. I put these on here. OK. So these are the fluency charts. Uh, that give you an idea of what percentile rank a, a child would fall into based on their words correct per minute. 
Mm -hmm. So, so we'll put these on our free downloads, right, Lorna? Yes. Yeah. Yes. This will be on the website. Yeah. So that's another thing you can look at. How are they doing with their fluency? Okay. Um, so we're, we're doing okay in, um, moving, moving through this. Uh, Lorna, talk a little bit about this continuum. Yes. And I'm also seeing something that Ann Andrew is talking about, but schools are offering audio now to get around this grade level text fluency issue. You are so right, Ann. And it's one of the things that just makes me crazy. Schools should never be allowed to substitute all those accommodations for teaching a child to learn how to read. You really need to stay with it and insist that they teach your child to learn how to read. Those accommodations can be wonderful while they are get, taking care of business, but they really need to uh, stay with the instruction. So let's talk for a second about the continuum issue. Literacy skills really exist on a continuum. There are some kids who learn how to read very easily. In fact, there are some kids who come into kindergarten already reading. You've probably met some of them. And some children will learn very easily um, once they start to receive instruction. Those are the children who tend to come into school already with well-developed phonological awareness skills. Those are the kids that will make any reading program look good. But we estimate that at least half of our school age population really need a structured literacy program in order to become good readers and to avoid any problems with, with learning how to read. And even those kids who are struggling with reading are also on a continuum because not all children have the same level of difficulty. Some have a mild level of difficulty and others really have a very severe problem. So the purpose of a professional diagnostic evaluation is really to determine where the child is on this continuum, what part of the reading process they're struggling with. You know, is it decoding? Is it phonological awareness? Is it fluency? Is it comprehension? And most importantly, what we need to do to improve their, their situation. Now let's talk about labels for a minute because labels sort of muddy the whole notion of a continuum. I think a continuum is it's more subtle, but it's probably a lot more accurate. When we label children, we, we do put them into categories. Um, but because we do that, we really, we really need to understand what these categories are all about. A learning disability is a neurological disorder. And it's caused by differences in brain structure or in brain function. And it interferes with the ability to process, store, or produce information. It can affect the ability to read, write, speak, or do math. I think it's easiest to think of a learning disability as an umbrella term because there are several different types of learning disabilities. For example, there's dyscalculia, the kind that um, causes problems with math. There's dysgraphia, which is a disability in the motor demands of handwriting. And of course, there's dyslexia. Dyslexia is a language-based learning disability. It is the most common type of a learning disability. And it interferes with reading and other language-based skills like spelling and written language. A reading disability, which is the term that I tend to use the most, is a broad term that's used by a lot of professionals. And it refers to all the students who struggle with reading. It includes all children on the continuum who are struggling readers. And it also includes dyslexia. It will include the more severe as well as the less severe children. The term specific learning disability is a term that is used by IDEA 2004. IDEA 2004 is our national special education law, uh, which applies to all of our states and to all of our public schools. Um, if a child is having trouble with reading, but is having no other developmental problems, then under this law, he is classified as having a specific learning disability. 
or as the teachers refer to it, SLD. Um, that, by that classification entitles a child to receive special educational services. It's a general term because it refers to all types of learning disabilities. I think that that covers our label, Sandy. Yes, yes. Do now, Stephen, Stephen was asking a question here about accommodation and modifications used as a bridge during the period between acquisition and coping skills are developed, not as a replacement. And I would definitely agree with that. You need both. Um, I think the concern expressed was, well, let's just give this child accommodations and pretend that everybody's okay. Um, and, and as a child begins to get older, I know with my son, he had to learn to advocate for himself. He had to learn um, in this digital age what kinds of things he could do to make um, his experience work for him. But in the meantime, we also had people working with him and helping him learn how to read. So you don't want to just, you don't want to do you don't want to err on either side. You don't want to take a child who is in a program picking up their reading skills and then hand them a science book they can't read. So to give them an accommodation in science, yeah, that's a wonderful thing and that's necessary. You just want to make sure that you don't think that's all you need to do is make an accommodation. Sandy, this sometimes becomes an issue for the older child, especially by high school. Because if a child in high school is maybe three or four or five years below grade level, and I do see that a lot, it's extremely difficult uh, to provide him with the level of services that are necessary so that he can keep up with the demands of the curriculum. There aren't enough hours in the day, and it becomes a real challenge. It requires a parent who is really good at advocating for services for their child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and we've had a comment here many times that kids that are dyslexic don't qualify for the umbrella diagnosis unless they're severely dyslexic. That's interesting um, that they then can't get the accommodations. Yeah, and I think, again, next week we're going to look a little bit on the evaluations, but sometimes... And Lorna, I think you're going to get into that when you talk about those composite scores, because sometimes kids may overcompensate, overcompensate, and because of their high intelligence level and their comprehension, they're doing well on part of their reading score. And if somebody doesn't look at the individual pieces of it, they're not going to get an accurate diagnosis. That's very true. And I would also suggest that... Um, if the school has found a child ineligible, it might definitely be worth going outside the school system for an independent evaluation yes. uh, to get diagnostic workup. Yes, which is exactly what I did in my case. And, and I, I moved my son around to private schools and public schools trying to get him the help he needed. But it was to the point that the public system was telling me I was simply an overprotective mother. They were making it very, very difficult for me, uh, putting a lot of pressure, trying to make me feel embarrassed that the problem was me. And I, at the time, the state that I lived in and researching the law, what I did was I wrote a letter saying that I did not accept the school's diagnosis and that I wanted to have an independent private evaluation and the school system had to pay for it. And they did. The school system paid for me then to go outside and repeat the testing. And that's when we were able to get the diagnosis. Um, Okay, so let's let's look at our wrap up here. Um, boy, this has been a tremendous group of people. All the the comments, and I've been trying to keep up with reading the chats and and, and um, looking at the screen and everything else. But we've just had a, a tremendous group here. Um, so we we'll we'll open it up for a few more questions. If you have any, we want to let you know that we are leaning towards. Um, setting up a system where you will be able to um, 
take our screening tests and, and video a child and have us take a look at that. We're leaning towards being able to review um, testing reports for you if that's something of interest. So we're going to send you a SurveyMonkey link to see if these things are of interest. We're leaning towards putting together an online class where you can maybe for a period of uh, five or six weeks when you have time download information, read it, and learn a little bit more about what you can do to make better readers and spellers, leaning towards maybe a follow-up of a structured literacy webinar. All of these things um, we want to do to help you. Uh, but uh, your mics are open. You can type in a comment. You can ask a question either way. Okay. Um, I would like to add one thing for anyone who is interested in getting feedback on, on the testing of a child. Um, I would suggest that you videotape the first testing of the child. Um, you don't want to allow your, the child to have an opportunity to practice. I want to be able to give you feedback on the first testing and the first time that the child has seen the word list and or the the um, passages. Okay, and I'm putting in our websites here. I've had uh, the teacher track is my website that I started, oh, a number of years ago now, probably six or seven years ago. Um, and then we have Smart Kid Can't Read based on the book and, and the resources around that. So both of these should be helpful sites for you. I also have a lot of free downloads over at the teacher track. Um, okay, any other me, questions, comments? Uh, Sandy, let me pose one other question to the group. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if there is any interest in people getting feedback on reports that they have received. And if so, perhaps that's something we could set up on the website too. They would have to uh, send copies of the reports and get feedback from us. So just let us know if you have any interest in that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, teacher track website isn't working for somebody. Make sure you put the teacher track, not just teacher track, okay? Uh, all right, let's see. What do you do when the public school doesn't recognize dyslexia as an official diagnosis? Oh, my goodness. Wow. Um. All right, now let me see what's going on with my website. I will try to get over there. Um, in the meantime, Lorna, do you want to um, take a look at these questions coming through? We got a lot of them. Yes, we do. So let me let me go up here. I'm not familiar with the CBC program. Um, sorry, I, I can't give you feedback on that. Can you tell me a little about it? Um, someone else is asking about uh, finding someone who will do the testing. I would suggest, and I'm not sure where you're where you're living, and I don't have that information. But I would suggest that you contact the state chapter of the International Dyslexia Association. Uh, the International Dyslexia Association has a chapter in most states. They oftentimes Wow. Uh, we'll have a list of people who can help you with testing. Also, the uh, LDA Association, Learning Disabilities Association, they may have some um, referrals for you. And I would check out another website, which is starting to, they're just beginning, but they're starting to set up a referral base, and that's Learning Ally. Right. Um, in the meantime, I found my store, but I don't know what happened to my website. <laughs> um, but right now on shop.theteachertrack.com, that is coming up. I need to find out what happened to my website, why it disappeared. But when I, um, when I email everybody and give you the recording, I will, I will get to the bottom of that. Okay, Lorna, did you get these other questions here? 
It's just... Well, I see Sarah is asking about how to teach the school what dyslexia is. You know, there are a number of books, um, and you're where I'm not sure where you are, Sarah, uh, but there are a number of very good books out there, and one of the books that you might uh, think about is the one by... Oh, I'm 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 having I'm having a, a total blank. Uh, I will get it to you, Sarah. <laughs> I can't okay. remember. I'm However, I'm smart not... kid, can't, smart kid can't read is a very good book too, uh, and okay. it gives a lot of background on dyslexia and a lot of background on what works when a child does have dyslexia. What kind of intervention is the most successful? And it gives a huge amount of background on how to test for dyslexia. So you can certainly start with that. Wonderful, thank you. Oh, and somebody's mentioning the Sally Shaywood's book also, Overcoming Dyslexia. That's that's a great read as well. That's the book I was trying to think of. Yes, that's a very good book. Good, good. Well, look at this. Um, some of these things will um, pop up in the recording that people are, are writing in here. Um, okay, so next week we will get into... Um, the evaluation of a reading disability, and uh, we're going to we're going to show you how to look at assessments. We want you to be informed consumers, in that uh, we don't want you to fall prey to someone that says they have done an evaluation that is less than thorough. We're we're not going to expect you to come out next week and um, be able to to buy all these tests and conduct all these tests. Um, our goal is for you to be able to read an assessment and understand it and know if it's well done. So we will we'll get pretty detailed next week. Okay, uh, I guess it's time to wrap it up. We just thank all of you so much. And uh, I will be sending you the recording link. Have a great night. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, good night now.